Hello and welcome to episode 18 of the Crash and Ride podcast. I'm Patrick Ferguson. I'm your host. Today's guest is Thor Harris. This is an interview I've been waiting to do forever. Thor is a multi-instrumentalist, primarily a percussionist. He's based out of Austin, Texas. He's played with the Swans, Angels of Light, Shearwater, Amanda Palmer, his own band, Thor and Friends, uh, Bill Callahan, Hospital Ships, just a million bands he's played with. He's also been an outspoken advocate for people who are suffering from depression and anxiety. He talks really frankly about his own struggles. In 1992, at the age of 27, he had a nervous breakdown, and he wrote about that in a book called Ocean of Despair that he wrote and illustrated and did a short speaking tour on a few years ago. And that's really how I came to encounter Thor, but he's someone I really, really, really admire. And man, I've been waiting to do this interview forever. If this is your first episode of Crash and Ride, uh, Crash and Ride is a long-form interview podcast where I talk to musicians who've survived anxiety, depression, and addiction. Like I said, my name's Patrick Ferguson. I'm a professional drummer. I play with Mike Mills from R.E.M. and his side project. We're doing a tour this fall with Chuck Lavelle from the Rolling Stones. There'll be dates for that on the Crash and Ride website. I'll uh, also announce those before future podcasts. I also play in the power pop punk band uh, 5-8 based out of Athens, Georgia. And for the last year, I've been in the band Pinky Doodle Poodle, a Japanese rock band from Tokyo. They've been living in touring in the United States now for about a year and um, I've got some dates coming up with them and those dates are as follows um, Wednesday July 10th we're in Dallas Texas at three links Thursday July 11th we're in Austin Texas at Empire Control Room along with one of my favorite bands in the world a band called the Gary the 13th of July we're in Ruston Louisiana at the Sundown Tavern July 19th we're back in Athens Georgia at Slop Fest at Little King Slop Fest is a is a multi-day festival of um, noise rock and punk and garage punk bands that are all going to play um, at this one bar called Little Kings. I highly recommend coming out for that. If you're anywhere near Athens, Georgia, that's going to be a really good time. It always is. And then um, Saturday, July 20th, Pinky Doodle Poodles back in Columbia, South Carolina at the Art Bar. I have some other big news that I'll be able to announce in, I think, about a week. Um, so stay tuned for that. Uh, in the meantime, I want to say thank you to everybody who's contacted me over social media or emailed us at crashandride at protonmail.com. I've gotten a lot of really positive feedback on recent episodes, especially uh, my interview with Richard Salino, which was episode 17. We talked about him surviving brain cancer and his subsequent recovery and uh, what that's meant for him emotionally and existentially. And several people who are cancer survivors or people who've lost a loved one to cancer have contacted me and, and, and thanked me for that episode. And This podcast is it's important to me. Not just because it's a thing that I do, but because it seems to be sort of the center of a small community of people who are, you know, recovering from depression, recovering from anxiety, recovering from addiction. And um, every one of you who contacts me or gives me feedback on social media, you're contributing to making it better. And it's it's already just in 17 episodes, it's become something that I'm just super proud of. And I'm super proud to be associated with the people who are a part of this community. It seems like everyone's kind of taking ownership for a part of it and um, offering to help out other people. Like if you look at the uh, show notes for episode 17, Richard asked me to put a link to his website so that anybody who wanted to get in touch could go there and get his email address and email him if they had questions about cancer treatment or cancer survival or, or being a survivor of someone who passed and, and Richard wants to help in any way he can. I've had several great interactions with people who listen to episode 10, my interview with Evan Rowe. Which, where he talked about how electroconvulsive therapy stopped working for him and he started doing ketamine and how that saved his life. And several people have contacted me to say, I need to know more about this ketamine thing. I'm at the end of my rope. And I've sent information to them and sent Evan's contact information out. And, man, it's just um, this is what I had hoped this would turn into, that we would all be part of this together. So thank you, thank you, thank you. With that in mind, I want to make a couple of quick announcements. If you're struggling with depression and you're contemplating self-harm, I'd like to suggest that you contact the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. It's toll-free, it's 24-7, it's confidential, it's staffed by trained volunteers. Thor Harris, in this very interview, talks about working on the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and how much he enjoyed it and, and how he feels like he was able to do some good in the world. So call 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-8255. Also this week, I discovered that there's a new trans lifelines peer support line. If you're a trans person and you're struggling with depression, anxiety, or thoughts of self-harm, call 1-877-565-8860. That's a trans lifeline peer support line, something I highly, highly support. Get some help if you're struggling. That's 1-877-565-8860. 
Okay, uh, Crash and Ride is brought to you in part by Greer Amplification. Greer Amp spills the best boutique effects pedals available. If you're looking for an overdrive, boost, fuzz, compressor, or tremolo that is rugged, road tested, and at home on stage, in the studio, or in your living room, Greer has a pedal for you. Nick and his staff strive to build the best products around with the best tone you've ever heard. They believe in their products and they stand behind them too, backing each one up with a lifetime warranty to the original owner. Each Greer Amps product is hand-built in Athens, Georgia, USA. Go to www.greeramps.com or to your local music retailer today. Crash and Ride is also brought to you in part by Jittery Joe's, a local coffee roaster in Athens, Georgia. They've created a special espresso blend named after this podcast. It's called Crash and Ride. It'll soon be available on their web store and on our web store once we get that built, which will be soon, I promise. Um, it's a really nice espresso blend. You can also sign up for a coffee sponsorship at www.patreon.com slash crash and ride. There's a $35 membership level where I send you a can of those beans every month. Then you're drinking my favorite espresso blend and you're also supporting the podcast for which I'm really grateful. That's all the announcements I have. I, I want to kind of contextualize this interview. You know, Thor and I have both been on tour pretty much nonstop for the past five or six months. I, I thought of this idea that I wanted to interview him, I think, before I really even fully dreamed up the podcast or the format. And he's been out with Shoo Shoo, uh, doing a bunch of European touring and, and touring with Thor and friends in the U.S. And I've been out with Pinky Doodle Poodle. And we finally found a day where we were both at home. And um, Thor's house, if you watch, there's a, there's a video in the show notes i would encourage you to watch before you listen to the interview um where you see thor's house it's a house that he basically bought it was falling down and it and he restored it and by restored it i mean he made it thor's house like it's full of his beautiful artwork and these crazy sculptures and 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 wind chimes with like the bones of animals that had passed that he he that he found and and um it's it's a really beautiful house and it's so uniquely his and I, you can hear him during the interview as we're talking he's sketching you can hear him zipping and unzipping these pouches of art supplies and you can hear like charcoal and 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 pencils on on paper and um and I think that it's really um you get a, a general feel of like just two drummers who are like cooling their jets for a minute and catching up and talking about possibly the most important thing that we could talk about and man I just feel like it's a really great interview so um, with that in mind, uh, let's jump into our interview with Thor Harris. Okay, I'm here with Thor Harris, drummer of the Swans, drummer of Shearwater, drummer of Thor and Friends. You've played drums for Shushu. You've been touring with recently Amanda Palmer. i got a million people. You're a busy guy. Oh yeah, I have a lot of nervous energy. Yeah, I I always tell people I have a deep well of anger, but um, maybe it's the same thing. You don't seem angry to me. I play for a you, lot of drums. <laughs> yeah, for you guys who haven't met Patrick, he's the nicest guy you'd ever want to meet. Man, it's a it's something I work on. So you're back in Austin after being on tour with Shushu for how long? Three months or something? Yeah, we were out three months. Two weeks of that was a Thor and Friends Europe tour. But um, other than that, it was all Shushu. And I went and played on a new um, a new Swans record, too, while I was... Oh, yeah? Yeah, there's going to be a new one, I think, in... I think it comes out in October. Something like that. Um, where did where did you guys make that record? Well, it was made all over the place, but um my part I did with the Hawk and a Hacksaw guys in uh -huh. Al in Albuquerque. They're wonderful people and I I work with them. They always work on um Thor and Friends records, and I played on a little bit on some of Heather's solo stuff. Yeah, I work with them whenever possible. So Hawk and Hacksaw is a band. Yeah, Hawk and Hacksaw is two is a couple, and they're from Albuquerque, and they play music that is inspired by music from the Middle East and Eastern Europe, um, and. Um, the guy 
Jeremy Barnes is is the drummer from Neutral Milk Hotel. Oh, Jeremy, I think lived here for a while. Yeah, he did. Neutral Milk Hotel has some um, Athens roots. Oh yeah. Now, I don't think any of them live there anymore. I could be wrong about that, but um, Jeremy and Heather moved. They bought a house back in their native New Mexico. Yeah. And um, yeah, the rest of them live all all over the country. Um, the main singer guy whose name I just forgot. Jeff Mangum. Yeah, Jeff Mangum lives in upstate New York. Yeah. Sweetheart of a guy. I've met him. Yeah. I don't know him that well, but... I've spent a little time in upstate New York, and I could perfectly understand wanting to live there. Oh, God, it's so beautiful. Swans, yeah. you... We, um, from 2010 to, to 2016, we rehearsed and, and hung out a lot in upstate New York because Michael lived in Saugerties, and it's so beautiful up there, especially in the summer. Yeah. Well, also, especially in the winter. It's yeah. just beautiful. I'm, I'm a big fan. Um, I've been up there a lot because this Japanese rock band, Pinky Doodle Poodle, that I've been playing with, their label's based out of Buffalo. So we go up there every couple of months and do some shows. Yeah. So you're you're living in Austin. You're you're pretty much touring constantly right now. Um, I, I saw you with Thor and Friends here in Athens just a few, I guess, six or seven months ago now, opening for Explosions in the Sky. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And... Uh, so, but where are you from originally? I'm from coastal Texas, right by Galveston. Galveston and that whole um, Gulf Coast of Texas is becoming increasingly unlivable because the hurricanes and giant storms are getting more and more ferocious. It's still really beautiful down there, mm -hmm. um, like giant seabirds and you know tropical looking plant life and that's um although it's really polluted because there's all this petrochemical industry down there i was gonna ask about that yeah a lot of people die of cancer around there but um right where i grew up we we mostly breathe the air off of the Gulf of New Mexico, the Gulf of Mexico, not the Gulf right. of New Mexico, because there's right. no such thing. Right. <laughs> but the Gulf so, of Me Mexico. Right as you're coming down, I think it's I-10 through Texas. There's a place where, right after you cross into the state, I I've seen this through the windows of the van touring now for 20 years. There's a place where there's like an RV park right by the water, and just across, like probably three quarters of a mile of water, there's this gleaming petrol chemical refinery. And it just seemed like, man, that's got to be called like Cancer Beach or something. <laughs> it doesn't look like yeah. a place you'd want to swim. Yeah. It's um all, all that is like, you have to wonder what is that land going to look like in a hundred years? Because now, because now that these giant hurricanes have started flooding that area, like every couple of years and just yeah, washing it over with like spilled chemicals from the refineries and everything. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, uh, you know, they, they, there's obviously a lot of, um, work going into keeping quiet. What exactly is washing over the land when they have these big floods of these chemical plants, but it's pretty scary stuff. And this summer, I know this because I still have friends and my brother just moved away from there. But one of those chemical plants was on fire for several weeks. Um, that was one in Houston, right? Yeah, it was in a in a horrible little place called Deer Park, um, which is one uh, little city over from La Porte, which is the city that I grew up in. It was on fire for weeks and. It was pretty scary looking black smoke billowing up into the sky every single day. I guess benzene for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm um, sure, sure that was in there. Yeah. There's a couple more I can almost think of. There's one that starts with X. I think about xylene. Those are all good ones. Yeah. Good stuff. 
<laughs> yeah, they figured out. Um, they figured out that the making of PVC, which is what most of our sewer lines and some of our fresh water lines are made of, um, emits dioxin. Mostly the making of it, maybe not right. using it once it's made, but that's why for the last 50 years they've been not 50, but 25 years they've been trying to remove PVC from our lives. Yeah. You've done some plumbing work. Did you ever work as a plumber? Or was it just because you're, I mean, you sort of, but yeah. just to contextualize this, you, you bought a house that was falling down in a neighborhood that was largely neglected and you restored that house and then some houses around it. Right. Yeah. And, and in, in the process of that, like I had, a, I had been a plumber's helper and worked as a plumber's helper before that and an electrician's helper and a carpenter's helper. So I had done a bit of that kind of work, mm -hmm. but, th but then in the rebuilding of this house, I just kind of, instead of resenting the fact that I was like a strong, dumb white guy. So of course I, I had to be a carpenter. Right. Um, I would, I've kind of fell in love with it. And, 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 um, so, now I still do that kind of work, plumbing and carpentry, and I don't do it all the time. I think I would love it a little less if I did it all the time. Yeah, but um, I I still do that kind of work. I, I have the same sort of experience with like that kind of work because I I worked as a carpenter's assistant for Curtis Crow, the drummer of the band Pylon. Um, oh, cool. I was terrible at it, and I I I still do that kind of work sometimes, but. When I do it, I'm just filled with fear the whole time because I just oh. think I'm going to fuck this up. I'm going to damage this house that's the only place we have to live. You know, it's not a great feeling. Oh, man. Yeah. Car carpenter anxiety. Yeah. Um, what I like to do is talk my friends through if they if they have almost enough confidence in themselves to yeah. do it. I like to talk them through it and. I mean, I can hang sheetrock all day, and I've helped a couple of friends convert garages into studio spaces. But um, when it comes to things like I've got to, I've got to frame this in, I'm always like, oh god. But, you know, uh, they uh, economists say that um, now, and even more so in the future, the people who have trades like that are going to be the 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 people with the greatest economic um security yeah that there huh. there's like you know whether your town is austin texas which is a boom town and has been for way too long or your town is indianapolis which is not booming it's just kind of the same as it's booming a little a little bit it's yeah some time there um but the there's a there's just a shortage of not insane tradesmen. Oh, you know, but before we get too far from the whole subject of the coastal Texas and the hurricanes, there was, as I recall, and you may know more about this than I do, there was a huge hurricane in the early 20th century. Yeah, I don't remember the name of the hur of that hurricane, and in fact, back then they might not have been naming hurricanes, but that hurricane really shaped that area because it killed 6,000 people. Yeah. In, something insane like that. In Galveston. I, you know, these days I can hardly imagine being killed by a hurricane. It, it is what it is, is, and I've been in uh, a couple, it's a lot of rain and it's really super strong wind. So, mm -hmm. um, Maybe it was just throwing things around so much that people got hit by things. I'm I'm really not sure. They had no warning system. It was yeah. nine, it was 1900. There were some telegraphs coming in from outlying islands. Like this storm is really bad, and then everything went silent, and folks were like, "Oh, well, I guess it wasn't that bad after all." <laughs> and the reason was, I think that like the 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 islands just got overtopped and everybody drowned. And there's some stories that I heard about people who got caught by the beach and decided to move inland because it got bad enough that they thought we're not going to survive here. And they locked arms and they walked out into the wind and the 
the the wind was pushing the sand so hard that the only parts of those people that were ever recovered were belt buckles and buttons. Wow. Because they were just sandblasted away. Yeah, and that's, you know, what resulted from all those deaths was everybody moved inland to Houston, which was yeah. very slightly higher ground. Um, and they built that city. And then oil happened just a few years later, and that became a huge industry which was of course connected to the port of Houston which is just mm-hmm. a it's just a ship channel that comes into Houston and and uh, where huge ships can go and dock and send so, all over the world so i am i am i correct do you remember that you were your mom was a single mom is that right yeah my dad died when i was 10 he worked at one of those he worked at one of the chemical plants that produced lead a lead oh additive for gasoline. And unsurprisingly, he died of cancer when he was like 47. Um, so, so I was raised by a single mom school teacher. She did eventually remarry and the guy was nice. So I had a nice stepdad. Um, How many siblings did you have? I have an older brother and an older sister. We're still very close. When did you start playing music? I started playing piano when I was about eight, and I started playing drums when I was nine. But I, I didn't really care about playing piano. Not much, but I fell in love with drums when I was about nine and studied in school and had a, you know, a private teacher. And um, it, it was like the first thing. Well, I was, I, I was already drawing and sculpting a lot but i was yeah. a ter- i was a terrible student so it was like the second thing that i found that i really cared about i think that's not so uncommon for people who struggle with depression is to have been awful in school because not yeah. just because of the accompanying attention deficit issues but also just because the level of apathy that comes along with depression makes it yeah. really hard to be a good student. When did you first you've been really frank and open historically about your struggles with with sadness and with with suicidal ideation, but when did all that start? Well, you you know, I I didn't get diagnosed with depression till I was 27, but uh-huh. once you're diagnosed, you can look back at your childhood and figure out the the, the years that you were depressed and then the years that you had some relief and i had depression much of the time um there were a few years in my early teens when i started lifting weights and running all the time yeah that that my depression was was uh, a lot less than it had been it was still present but um, do you think that was a maybe a bipolar swing to like suddenly have enough energy to go run or I think um no I think I got a job as a roofer and I was yeah. like fif- I was like 15 and I figured out that girls liked dudes with muscles I didn't know that at all before and um so I just started doing push-ups and sit-ups and you know like basic exercises and and um I think that almost immediately i don't think it was a manic swing i think it was just it alleviated my depression and anxiety so it felt good so i kept doing it yeah and because my hormones were crazy at the time i was you know just starting to be flooded with testosterone um i just turned into this little muscle bound kid practically overnight did you play sports at all I didn't. Not really. I, I, no, I wasn't into team sports at all. Yeah. I was, a, I was like a band and art school dork. Right. I, I didn't want to <laughs> get, I didn't want to get hit hard by 300 pound guys. Yeah. When did you move to Austin? I think I was 19. So it was after my, I went to, college at Stephen F. Austin, which is in Nacogdoches in e- far East Texas. It's really boring out there. It was a great place to study. Yeah. Um, but then I moved to Austin to finish art school. After going to 
Musicians Institute in Hollywood for a few months and studying with all these amazing drummers out there. I, how, did, uh, how did that come about? Well, my friend was going to the Guitar Institute and he just wanted me to come with him. Just um, And his dad paid my tuition, so I went. Man, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I, did, I was working as a lifeguard in, in my hometown, Laporte, and that opportunity came up and I moved to Hollywood, which was so eye-opening. I'd never seen so many like crazy people just staggering the streets, you know, it, like in central Hollywood. It was so amazing and eye-opening just to see these bizarre zombies and like... Um, early plastic surgery victims wandering the streets of Hollywood in the mid eighties. It was, it was just amazing having, you know, coming from suburban Texas. Um, it was, it was so um, eye opening and beautiful. I remember growing up in a small town in South Georgia, which is probably not terribly different than, than than coastal east coastal texas but like there were these people who would go away to to berkeley college of music or the music institute of technology and there was this kind of like oh if you want to be a musician then you should follow this liberal arts model path through like as i think back on it now how naive it was but there was this idea that well this will validate this talent that i have so that i can go on to do this thing that i would really prefer to do over everything else oh man that's funny. So did you get a liberal arts degree? I dropped out of school after two years. I came to, I, I, did, I did a couple of years of community college, just like you did, and then came to Athens to finish up my schooling and immediately fell into like this just roiling, heavily active, uh, super creative music scene. I mean, started playing with Vic Chestnut almost immediately and um, joined a bunch of bands all at once because you know how it is with drummers. We're pretty yeah. in demand. And um, like started missing classes because I had been up all night gigging or practicing or traveling. And and um, by the end of my first year at, at University of Georgia, I was done with school and dropped out in the middle of a semester and didn't bother to withdraw from classes and just went out on tour. Man, and, this um, is my tale with University of Texas exactly. I got to Austin and found – like all the weirdos and right started forming bands with them. And that's kind of what I still do. So dropping out of college was a great move for me, man. It was a huge rupture with my family. There were a couple yeah, of years where mine, just going home for the holidays was totally fraught. Uh, mine too. Kind of, uh, my mom really wanted me to finish college. She was born in 1927. So she grew up through the depression. She was a, she was a, a uh, big justice and civil rights advocate, but she also oh, had man. this. So she, weird. So was my mom. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. She also, she also had this real like fear of, of dying in poverty. Um, and, and the way out of that, you know, that she saw was to get a college degree. Yeah. Now, well, nowadays economic security is kind of better supported by having a trade. If you can right. fix computers, if you can fix modern cars, if you can fix houses, if you're a plumber or a carpenter or an electrician, you know, people who have trades have the, you know, the yeah. most true economic security. But that wasn't how my mom saw it. My mom grew up in a time in the Great Depression when... I guess you couldn't get a job. Well, I don't know. You know, it was a different world that I don't know that much about. But having yeah. a college degree was was a lot more marketable than it is nowadays. Yeah. Um. So, so you 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 went to L.A. You were in Hollywood for how long? Like four months. Four very eye opening months. Um, yeah. Then it was time to start to start school again so i moved to austin and i was bored to tears in austin for the first year that i was going to ut mm -hmm. um but but i you know i don't know i i did start to find the interesting people and um 
I'm dying I, to ask you this question. You you mentioned that when you got to Los Angeles, you saw like people who were like walking wounded, people in, in need of mental health care for the first time who were sleeping on sidewalks and sleeping in parks and stuff. Um, I've only lived in urban areas a couple times in my life, some brief time in Chicago, and I was in Washington, D.C. for about the same amount of time that you were in Los Angeles. And I remember having already had some struggles with depression and, you know, those times where you're unable to, to even get out of bed yeah, and, and, and certainly not get out and make a living thinking, as I saw those people – Man, I am one major depressive episode from sleeping in a park myself. Man, I, I I certainly have I certainly had those thoughts and when when my brain was really uh really coming apart and and just disintegrating when I was living in San Francisco in 92, um I would I would hang out with homeless people to try to figure out if there was any difference between them and me um yeah. and you know and i liked them and uh you know i, I found them i i really liked them and i did identify with them and i and i i did i did think that we had a lot in common you know mental illness yeah but. i i get real anxiety when i'm around people who are who are unable to function sometimes it's a secret shame of mine that when i spend time around people for whom like who have been failed by society and have no resources, I get super anxious because I'm always sort of, and I've never confessed this to anybody. In the back of my mind, I'm always thinking, man, I'm so close to this. Like yeah. it's just going to take one period of me falling apart and and like not being able to function that out. And I, I like on in my rational mind, I know like like you know I've got the skills to make a living and 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 I've got people who care about me and and you know there's no limit to the resources that the people who love me are willing to bring to bear if I need it. But there's still a part of me that just secretly suspects that like at some point, you know, I'll, I'll be sleeping in the woods. It's not a great feeling. I know. I think that that's sort of related to, to, I think that, that that's sort of related to, um, you know, if you're ever like working with a bunch of great musicians and you kind of feel like, well, I hope they don't notice that I'm really just a hack. <laughs> I think it's I think it's a similar I think it's a similar thing like wow I hope that in polite society they don't notice that I'm really you know halfway insane and kind of just a wild animal that learned to talk. Yeah, you should if you get a chance man episode 4 of this podcast I interviewed this guy who's one of the most brilliant people I know he speaks four or five languages and plays every stringed instrument and all these crazy tunings. Um, and he, he he just is punished by imposter syndrome constantly. It <laughs> feels like it's all just going to go away. Um, man, that's it's so true. So wait, you so you you do a year at U of Texas in Austin? Yeah, and then um, my grades were so bad, and I I I got this job at this at this sandwich shop called Thundercloud, and. It, it, they would hire like the all the weirdos, the weird looking people. At that time, it wasn't about tattoos and piercings. It was just like the long hairs and the you know people who dressed wrong and stuff. They would hire all those people at this sub shop called Thundercloud, and so they hired me. And I just got you know started meeting the freaks and um, forming bands with them, which I found much more rewarding than than the art department at University of Texas, which still, you know, the art and music departments at University of Texas are really pathetic to this day. And and that was how I felt about them at the time. I didn't know that I was any judge of, of that. I thought I was just bored with school in general. But it, it turns out that, no, they're, they're pretty... Um, they're both pretty pathetic departments. My, my, um, when I'm, so I still go and do the artwork for the, for the musical theater production at my high school. That was, that yeah. was like, I, I did that when I was a teenager. That was one of the first times I ever felt like I belonged to a, to a group of people or to anything, you know, 
good. Um, I the the theater people discovered that I was good at drawing and painting, and and um, I saw I would do set designs for this huge um, theater production that my high school puts on once a year. And it's still the same lady directing it. She's probably almost 80 now. She's oh, retired. Wow. She's retired, but she still comes and directs the the play once a year. Um, and it's a huge production. It's like 500 kids working on sets and huge dance numbers. And it's always one of the Classic Broadway musicals like Singing in the Rain, Guys and Dolls, um, you know, one of those kind of shows. That they, sure. We did The Wiz, um, and, but I wasn't ever involved in the musical parts of it. I, I would make art for it. I would do paintings and set stuff. So I go and do that. Anyway, one of our kids who was like a real art prodigy um, was applying to different schools and she showed her her um, portfolio to the University of Texas. And they said, I think the guidance counselor there said, you know, you're already so good that the art department here has nothing to offer you. You should go to a better school. <laughs> wow. It, how sad is that? So she ended up going to this great school that's in Baltimore. I forgot the name of it, but it's a, it's a really awesome visual arts school. And there's some good stuff going on in Baltimore. I really like that town. Yeah, me too. Um, I'm friends with a bunch of bands from there. Um, Wye Oak and yeah. uh, Future Islands. And um, Do you know Multicult? I don't think I know any of them. I, I know the name. Are you friends with those guys? The drummer, Jake, is the first interview I did for this podcast. And... He uh, is just a mind-blowing drummer. Just He's got that, besides just a, a huge amount of technical skill, he's also, I mean, just like incredibly crisp player, but also super loud and, um, and, and, and writes these drum hooks, things that, rhythms that get stuck in your head for like weeks. And you sit down to the kit, you think this shouldn't be too hard. And then an hour later, you're like, fuck Jake Krager. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's but cool. Like, he still, we still talk pretty frequently because he's a fan of the podcast. But we, I played a show the other day in Winston Salem, North Carolina, with the Japanese rock band, and a guy came up to me after and said, "Are you in Multicult?" And I, I don't think I've ever been so flattered by anything in my entire life. I'm going to give them a listen. Yeah. So, so you do a year in Austin and and decide to bail on the department there. Yeah, but yeah, but by then I was sort of. Figuring out the town, figuring out the weird pace of Austin in the mid '80s. It was a, it was, you know, it was, it was really like the movie Slacker. It yeah. was, it was just a weird, slow-paced but very smart small town at the time. A lot of weird people did what they wanted to do instead of making a good living with their big brains. They did just weird stuff. Instead of making a good living, they made good lives. Yeah, exactly. Um, nowadays, it's pretty expensive to live here, so people do uh, have to make money. You you kind of got ahead ahead of that though, and 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 sort of rehabbed a, a house that was falling down, right? Yeah, I bought a house in the '90s, and so I'm sort of grandfathered into what is now like a pretty desirable neighborhood. But at the time it was, you know, some people were scared to come over here, but I, you know, I still have still, some of my neighbors are working class. Yeah. It's not all fancy people, thankfully. Right. So uh, recently I, I remember you made a Twitter video about, working for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Oh, yeah. And being, and being able to see your own uh, intake forms from when you contacted the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Yeah. When did you first start reaching out for help? 92. Um, that, that, that's when I first saw a shrink in San Francisco. Yeah. And that, sh that shrink told me she... She said, I think you have depression. 
you've just moved here from Texas. I think you should go back to somewhere where you have a lot of support and you have familiar surroundings. And I think you should start seeing a psychiatrist there for depression. How long were you in San Francisco? I guess I was there four or five months. What prompted the decision to move there? You know, I, I wanted better weather. I like the, I like the cold more than oh, I yeah. like, more than I like the hot. And yeah. uh, summers in San Francisco are glorious. So glorious. And um, I don't know. You know, I, I didn't really know this, but San Francisco has not had a had a music scene in in a long, long time. I mean, there was a little bit of one in the '90s, but it was already getting too expensive for you know, right artists to live there so well, all those texas punks moved there though like mdc half those guys are from texas and didn't the dicks also like some of those guys moved to san francisco from texas yeah i think they did um, so there was this kind of precedent but yeah like when i was hearing about that though was i saw mdc live a couple times in the late 80s early 90s and people were already talking about how san francisco is getting too expensive for punk rock yeah then I went out there in 91 to make an album at Brilliant Studios, and um, I was beginning to see the sort of thin edge of the wedge of gentrification happening in the mission. And there was a huge homeless population around yeah. Market Street. Yeah, it's pretty astounding now. There's rich people and tons of homeless people. It's a, it's, it's, I mean, it's not quite as bad as Vancouver, but it's sort of like that where the completely broken live right next to billionaires. So did you take the psychologist advice and leave? Yeah, I did. I did. I, I called my sister and told her I was, I was considering killing myself and asked her if, if she had a better idea. And she said, come stay with me for a while and see my shrink. And of course that guy diagnosed me with depression also. And I started taking meds and they didn't work at first. And then I changed to a different one and, and I didn't think it would work, but meds did actually work on me. And slowly I started to feel like my old self again. Yeah. Well, at what point? So I guess, have you ever thought about what point old self stopped and then troubled self started? And like, was there a transition there? It was slow. My, you know, I think what, what led me to move away from Austin, Uh looking back on it was some of that was depression. I was trying to get away from like a failing self esteem and, and, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I felt that Austin had no use for me anymore, and I was hoping to go away and go away to nicer weather and and reinvent myself or something. I was crushed that my first band, Stick People, had broken up. I just was not very good at endings. Um, and do you think that has anything to do with the death of your father? Yeah, I think it does. I I lost my dad when I was 10, and I think I was just, you know, blindsided by... I didn't think that I... I didn't think people that I knew would just go away forever when I was was 10. There's no way to emotionally prepare for anything when you're 10 like that. Yeah. And um, my mom died like two and a half years ago when I was... I guess 52 or something. And she was Mm -hmm. almost 90. And the difference in the way that I'm, I've been processing losing her versus the grief of losing my dad, you know, which took decades to process. Yeah. Um, As I recall, you had also mentioned that part of your frustration and sadness and inability to cope with life at the time you first sought help was also sort of wrapped up in the death of Kurt Cobain. Is that correct? 
Um, that was sort of my second episode. I, I, um, I, I had gone on to meds for about a year and a half, and then I went off of them, which is kind of common practice. And why do we do that? <laughs> I don't know, but my shrink, my shrink said, "Well, you're you're pretty good now if you want to try going off of these meds." So I went off of them, and I was okay for a few months, and then springtime came, which is often when I get seasonally affected depression and anxiety. Same. Totally um, same. Same thing. And, Springtime is the worst for me. Yeah. And Kurt Cobain killed himself. And all I could feel was envy and admiration at the, at how decisive, you know, such a thing is. I mean, he was probably drunk and I, I've never had that luxury. I've been pretty much straight edge my whole life. I did go through a period of, in my mid twenties, where I like to do acid, but um, and some other hallucinogens, but I never was a drinker. Um, yeah, he was. His thing was dope, though. It's hard to be much of a drunk when you're using dope. It, yeah, it titrate and get really weird fast. But. Yeah, he he. Uh, did he like heroin? Yeah. 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 He 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 um he was he was. He shot up before he killed himself, apparently. Wow. Um, part of the struggle, I think, with his depression was an inability to kick dope. And, oh. Um, yeah, the, there's been a lot of discussion about he had a pretty kind of street drug level kit, like a cigar box with some dirty cotton in it and some singed spoons and just, you know, just dope. Just the sort of standard junkies kit. But I think that one of the great misconceptions people have about fame is that somehow, like, it automatically just shit gets better than that. When, you know, the truth is, is that, number one, most people on major labels aren't seeing much of that money after all. And if they are, they're all fucked up about it because so many of their primary relationships have been just destroyed by the the machine that, that – anyway, that's a whole other discussion. But Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a different set of problems. Yeah. It, do, it does make some things easier, but it makes a lot of most, things, most things worse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you went to get help a second time. Yeah. And, and that was the intake where I went in and saw this real, um, that was the intake that I read. The one yeah. that you were talking about that I, that I, made that video about the one that yeah i was working for the agency a few years later and i got to read my intake and that guy was he was like a real he was kind of an aspergery uh real flat affect psychiatrist Mm -hmm. and and uh i can't remember his name but he was there for years working at psychiatric emergency services and i worked at the suicide hotline, which was right next in the office next to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Years later. So how did you get from there to the swans? Uh, so I was working at the suicide hotline and my friend Robert was friends with Jarbo. They're still friends. Um, She was on a label with that. I was on at one point. Yeah. Um, I'm going to get, she's going to, She's going to sing and or play on a couple of my... So I'm making six records this year for Joyful Noise. It's part of my artist in residence thing that I'm doing with them. That's so cool. And they're gonna have, I'm going to have a, a bunch of different guests, um, mostly women, but uh, you know, some dude friends of mine, too, are going to play on it. Mm-hmm. And... and um, and I'm going to get her to sing on something. But anyway, my friend Robert, he was working at the suicide hotline with me and mm-hmm. he knew he knew the swans. And so I just wrote them a post a sort of fan postcard. Yeah. And um, told them if they ever needed a drummer, because I did notice that they, you know, had some personnel change over the years. Then I met them when they played their final shows in 96 96 or 97 in austin 
And then Michael asked me to come to Atlanta before I knew Patrick Ferguson in, right. in um, Athens <laughs> and, and play on the first Angels of Light record. So I rented a minivan and packed it up full of weird homemade instruments um, and, you know, just weird percussion instruments. Mm-hmm. I, and then, uh, yeah, we just liked each other and liked working together. So you, you, at some point, I've seen one of your talks that you did and uh, an illustrated book about dealing with your depression. And you talked about being on your bike on this blistering hot day and encountering a dead snake yeah. in the road. And, well, I'm, I'm curious where along this timeline that happened. And, and I don't, maybe people haven't seen that, so maybe you could tell a little bit of that story again and how it affected your decisions about getting better. Yeah, it was weird to be around babies and to, and to be around a dead snake. Because I remember, a, like, I would hold my niece, who was, like, two years old, and she felt so alive. Um, and, and, and I felt sort of dead at the time. I had this horrible depression. And, um, yeah, I, I was riding my bike. This was way before I met Swans. Well, really, I guess about, uh, let me think, I guess about four or five years before I met Swan. So it was, it was in a time where I had pulled away from the world. I had lost touch with a lot of my old friends, and I was just hiding out at my sister's house in East Texas, waiting to get better. And I went on a long bike ride. I was all. I was still. I had a bicycle with me, and I was still um, doing that a lot. And and. Um, just because I was riddled with anxiety and exercise helps a lot with that. And I found this dead snake in the middle of the road and there was blood all around it. And it was just burning hot day. And I laid down on the road next to the snake and felt like a weird kinship with this dead snake. Um, And just looked up at the burning sky and, it just felt like we were two two dead things laying there under the sun. Um, and yeah, I wrote. I, that's a page from this little graphic novel that I made about depression. It's called Ocean of Despair, and I try to sell it at the at, at the merch booth with whoever I'm touring with. Um, it's still it, it's about to get reprinted, so. Um, yeah. If I ever hit the lottery, I'm just going to buy a million copies of that. Just, we're just, <laughs> just going to give them away. I thought it was one of the cool. most amazing things I've ever seen. The Ocean of Despair is a truly great book. Thanks. It's yeah. It's one of the briefest accounts of going insane that I've ever read. It's funny that you would mention holding babies because you know um, that time that you stayed here for a couple of days, and you and I were watching my daughter. And making bread and hanging out, and one of my wife's actor friends showed up with her daughter, who I guess at that point was eighteen months old. And oh yeah, was like, where's Lisa? That that's my wife, and uh, I was like, she's running a rehearsal two hours from here. What's up? She's like, I need somebody to watch my daughter. I have a show, and I guess that she thought she had covered that base, and she hadn't. And then you and I were in this sort of two men and a baby situation. Yeah, <laughs> but man, I you think- were. You were aces with that baby. Like I had oh, never good. had an eighteen month old. We we adopted um my daughter was twenty five months, and so this was a whole new stage of life for me to deal with. But she just loved you pulling on your beard and hanging out. And it was really funny. Oh yeah. I yeah, I remember hanging out with her and yeah. watching you make bread. That was yeah. a that was a great day. It was good. I, I I um when I was depressed, when I was at my worst, kids were terrifying to me. Yeah. And I can't explain exactly why, except that they just felt like a level of responsibility that I could never meet because I couldn't take care of myself, much less someone else's like beautiful spark of life that I didn't understand, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's weird. Um, when, when you are 
I think it, it sounds like your depression, much like mine, is kind of episodic, meaning that it comes on and it's very different than how you are much of the time. Yeah. Um, that's how mine is. I, I There's another kind that they call dysthymia. And um, I'm not I sure think I know that what that is. Tell me about d- that. Dysthymia is it may be you know how they change the terms in in the psychiatric industry they change sure. the terminology all the time like nobody uses manic depressive or right now it's bipolar yeah but dysthymia is is a kind of depression where it doesn't cycle very much. It's not like you don't have real bad, horrific episodes, or you might, but it's sort of low-grade, all-the-time depression. Um, and I have several friends who I, that describes them. Um, but, but I didn't really... I think most of the time growing up, I didn't have depression constantly i had a lot of periods where i was fairly happy and i my my family are wonderful people most of them are dead now but um both of my parents are dead and my grandparents are all gone but my brother and sister are still around and they're you know so i don't i I don't come from like like damage or abuse or anything like that but um some pretty emotionally healthy but i just have this weird um chemical vulnerability in my brain mine is Um, mine is much like a sine wave like i have periods of just like completely carefree life and then yeah it's usually triggered by some kind of rejection um from you know, a love relationship or or something goes horribly wrong with my family, which doesn't happen as often as it used to. Um, but I pitch into this self-loathing inability to cope with life on life's terms cycle. And for years, that was compl- complicated by drug use. Um, but even as a sober person, now I still have hard, hard weeks. Um, uh, less... Now that I can sort of identify unhealthy patterns, but I still get really, really wrapped up in, 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 in people's perception of me as an artist, you know, as a drummer, because yeah. a, a big part of what I do is I try to f- like fulfill someone's need as, as a performer and, and sort of be Johnny on the spot as a drummer. And if at some point I fall short, then the, like the beating I give myself is pretty epic. Yeah. Yeah, that that all sounds horrifyingly familiar. <laughs> um, yeah, so you you, you did mean, the Swans for what? I was like fifteen years, ten years. I can't remember. Well, it was on and off, and it, yeah. I, because I just did a recording with them, it's it's kind yeah, of ongoing. Still doing it, um, yeah. but I started in ninety eight, yeah, and that was with Angels of Light, which was a which was a Swans project when after Swans had ceased to exist, um, and some people like it more than Swans. It's kind of prettier, more orchestrated music. Um, but Michael is the singer, and I I kind of like it more than Swans. But I've done more work with Swans than with Angels. I played on the first Angels record and maybe the third one. And then um, we reformed Swans in 2010, and that took over my life until like about 2016. In a good way, I, I needed my life to be taken over. I, I was about to. I was in a. I was in Shearwater, and that band was kind of starting to go a direction I didn't believe in. Um, yeah, you did Shearwater for like tw- almost like, ten years, right? Yeah, I did. It, I was in it for twelve years, I think. Yeah. I wow. did a lot of I did a lot of other things in the meantime. Angels of Light. I mean, there's been a lot of overlap, um, right? But but um, but and and uh, I was in a relationship that needed to die in 2012, and Swans certainly helped me through that. Michael is an incredibly generous boss, and 
a super loyal friend and um he's he is deaf you know he's not an easy guy to work with that's an that's no secret but um he's someone i he's one of my heroes for sure artistically speaking and in some ways personally um although he's as i said sort of impossible right. sometimes right well um, yeah i mean i played with Vic chestnut for a while so I, oh I man it. i yeah. heard that guy was a handful well he was brilliant but he had this life-changing accident at 19 that put him in a wheelchair and he could just be incredibly uh cantankerous yeah as anybody who sort of has this incredibly quick mind but just huge frustration with his lack of mobility and you know in this almost like flannery o'connor like sense of the absurd of his absurdness of his own existence and so he 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 could yeah he could be real challenging i mean he used to heckle bands like it was his job wow you know? like he would show up at a show and position himself to where pretty much only the performers on stage could hear him because he'd be behind the mains and he would like you could see the little like the the tumblers tumbling behind his eyes until he came up with the most incisive cutting and brutal insult that he could think of and he'd shout it at the band. Oh you know? my god. <laughs> it, it was just one of those things after a while it became a badge of honor that you've been heckled by Vic Chestnut. Wow. Um, he was he was there for the worst five eight gig of all time. Um and uh I don't remember what he sh- shouted, but it was something like Altamont, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> and and um, Mantioni is a way of just trying to Mike Mantioni, the singer from Five A, is a way to try to deflect that thought. I'm just going to get Vic up here on stage, and he bent down to get Vic's wheelchair up on stage, and just Vic just punched him right in the fucking jewels. Look, like wow, <laughs> yeah, it was wow, yeah. I mean, he was a stormy guy, and yeah. you know, Mike Mike himself has his moments, but um, also like the fact that people continue to make compelling art in spite of all these, like all the human frailty that they're consumed by, I think is, is a testament to what's possible. Yeah. And and I I see that with, with Michael and I, um, you know, I know that, that, that difficult people is substantial and profound and, and revelatory and life affirming. Yeah. Yeah. So have you been doing meds pretty much nonstop? Yeah, like yeah, like um, twenty seven years. What are you taking? I take a generic form of Paxil. Yeah. And it's been that's that's pretty consistently effective. Yeah. Um, the thing that's hard it, for me about SSRIs is that you're trying to hit a moving target. You know, like your brain chemistry is one way you take something to fix it. Well, now you're putting those drugs on top of, you know, what is a, a, a moderated lack of serotonin and, and things get a little wacky sometimes. But I think that it's all about dialing it in. It sounds like you're pretty dialed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I've, you know, in the thousands of discussions with people who, deal with depression sometimes i ask people well what meds have you tried and they don't even know i I feel like you really have to uh you have to be your own caseworker you need to know what meds you've tried and what ones work and you need to learn stuff about these meds when when i started taking them they actually didn't know how they worked it was you know they had discovered them a little bit on accident but they still didn't really know how they worked, um, yeah. and and they weren't even called SSRIs back then. I w- I went on the second one that came out on the market, Zoloft, and I was on it for seven years, and it worked pretty great. I did that for for a year and a half, two years. Yeah, um, it had some interesting side effects. Yeah, um, um, I remember standing on a beach in Belize. I had gone down there. Um, with a person I used to be in a relationship with, and um, mm-hmm. I was I was washing down my Zoloft with uh, like some pineapple juice that had just been squeezed out of an actual pineapple, and I was thinking, this seems superfluous here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I think that was a like I started tapering then, 
Oh, a, lot, a lot of dizziness when I tapered off of Zola. Yeah, it's weird coming off of those drugs. Yeah. I've, I've had a couple of friends kill themselves while coming off of antidepressants. Man, I just think that this, any transition going on your first month of taking anything like that, the month of coming off, you need to be ta- checking in with somebody every day. Yeah, my friend, uh, a friend of mine just did that. He, he was coming off of meds and he sort of set up this online support group and we would check in. Yeah, I didn't know the most of the people because he's a friend from 25 years ago and I have really haven't seen him in 20 years. But he he started checking in with this group of people and I was on the list just because he knew that I was outspoken about depression um, and so he, we would all just check. I think he's doing okay now. He's a fellow drummer, and he got off meds. Uh, Tell me a little bit more about your advocacy, because that's you know part of what made me go. I, I got to get to know this guy. Was reading Ocean of Despair, seeing a couple of videos, but like you've done a whole tour where you were sort of promoting Ocean of Despair and speaking. Was that just a one-off, or is that something you still do? It was. I would like to do it again. Um, read it in little bookstores and things. Uh, you know, I was ashamed to be a, a mental health patient for about t- a year or two. And I was in my, you know, late twenties. So that, that's a pretty shameful time anyway. Like, you know, it's, it's a pr- pretty messed up time in a lot of people's lives. That- I think part of that is just realizing what a shit you were in your early twenties. Yeah. Because yeah. really, I, I don't think you don't have that first uh, what people who do psychedelics call ego death, which can either happen from psychedelics or can happen from just having the life crushed out of you but have, by having to live with the consequences of the bad decisions you make in your yeah. early 20s. But yeah, you're living a fairly hedonistic, self-driven lifestyle until the point where someone says to you, I hereby reject you and everything that you believe in and who you are because you've been so terrible and you have to go through the rebuilding of your life from that process. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You said a lot there. I mean, I did it. It was rough. It happened to me at 21 and I just thought. God, it happened to me at 21 all, or at 20 also. <laughs> that was uh, that yeah. y- that whole year, me and my friend Terrence just lifted weights and talked about our desire to die every day. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think and that, that makes you an Antifa super soldier. That, that was a... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that was uh, that was my first year in Austin, and while I was going to UT, me and my my high school friend Terrence were, um, I think, both going through horrible depressive episodes. And where is he now? He's a, he's in Colorado, and he he, is he still okay? yeah he is he's he's off of meds, but he still wrestles with perhaps bipolar he's a great guy he's one of my favorite people on earth still he's so smart and so funny and insightful and um he might be a little aspergery but sometimes i mean he says he is i sometimes have my doubts um about that but i don't know but i think that these things are a continuum just like the kinsey scale yeah you know like you're neither a hundred percent straight or a hundred percent gay, a hundred percent on the spectrum, a hundred percent off the spectrum. Like these things are all, um, and even calling it an X, Y axis, like, I mean, a straight, a, a, a line is, is misleading. I think it's more of an X, Y axis where there's different yeah. sort of quadrants. But so your late twenties, you're, you're sort of having this existential meltdown. Yeah. Then I sort of rebuilt myself, and I don't know. I it's a thing that I have to adjust sometimes, but I I I kind of to the best of my abilities, I kind of murdered my ego in some ways back then, or or yeah. the world the world murdered it or something. It was a I got that. Killing. Yeah, I got better <laughs> better at leaving it out of my music playing. Music became a different thing. And it still actually is 
constantly changing. It's it's Terry Riley um, does a lot of super interesting interviews, and I listened to one recently where he talked about music as a spiritual practice. Yeah, instead of music as entertainment or as you know being a showman, you're isn't that a, sort of the the great like art and commerce divide though like yeah at some point like you can't expect music to to necessarily pay your rent and, yeah and, and either you can stop um or you can f- realize that you've been doing it for a whole other reason your whole life that you were just trying to seek affirmation through material reward but there's something much deeper that causes us to continually go to the drums and and be with the drums or guitar, or whatever you play. Yeah. So yeah. So what did what did Terry Riley say after about that? Um, that was it. He he just said that throughout his life, he he had more and more come to think as he started hanging out with 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 um all all of his sort of musical gurus from India. He had learned to make to wake up in the morning and go to an instrument without without knowing what he was going to play and just sing what he played. So doing it as a spiritual practice and and not so much, you know it. I, I, yeah. Th- An extension think, of your ego and a way to make a living. Yeah, yeah, it's different. Yeah, yeah, and I, 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 I you know, in the in the band Thor and Friends, that feels more true for me in that band than that than in anything I've ever been involved in. None of us in that band are virtuosos at the instrument that we mm-hmm. play and there's no there's no solos and there's there's nothing showy about that music. It's just um it's gorgeous. Thanks. I, 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 I when I saw you open for Explosions in the Sky, I did not think when I I had had the record for a couple of days and then I was really, you know, absolutely stoked to see you play and was not prepared for how some of the people around me in the audience took that as provocation. They felt like you were being confrontational by being so like, like they're, it, they'd come to see this rock band that has sort of each song has a, a prelude, uh, some action, uh, a catharsis, and an end, because that's sort of the post-rock thing. It's very sort of emotionally structured. And then opening for that was this band that was doing this meditative, almost mantra-like music. And I thought, well, this would be nice for people to have a little something different. And there were people around me who were like, what the fuck is this? And they were mad about it. Oh, that's, so, just, that's so good to hear. Well, I actually had to tell a guy, look, you can talk shit about this performance if you want, but I'm trying to enjoy it. So if you keep doing it right here, then I'm going to end up throwing you down and, and, <laughs> and it's going to go badly for both of us, you know? Oh, it's so good. Um, because this guy was right behind me. He was just like, what the fuck is this? I do not understand what's happening. And I'm offended by this. And I was just like, bro, shut up. Nobody cares. You know? Wow. That's so great. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm so flattered by that yeah. response. <laughs> I think it's a good one, you know. Yeah. Like if you came, if you came to to get exactly what you expected, and and you got something that confounded your expectations, then I think that Thor and Friends has accomplished something remarkable. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, some of my some of my favorite records when I first heard them, I was just like, "Oh, what, what are you doing?" But then I, uh, the first time I heard the Dead Kennedys, I was like, "This sounds like dogs barking." Yeah, I do not understand what I'm at that point. You know, I was this pre teenager who was living in South Georgia. I'd heard Night Ranger, ACDC, and Van Halen. And then to hear uh, In God We Trust Incorporated, I was like, it sounds like barking. Like, what is that sound? You know, <laughs> and, um, you know, now that's like 
as I look back on all the hardcore I've consumed since then, that's like one of the more sort of almost pop driven records. But at the time it was just absolutely shocking to my system. Yeah. I met that guy. Well, I met Jello once we hung out after a Swans show. Such a nice guy. He seems like an incredibly eccentric, interesting dude. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of glad I've never been in a band with him because he seems like he might be one of those guys who's like, you know, I need this chord to smell more like violets. Like, I don't know how to make a guitar chord smell like violets, Jello. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but like he seems like one of those guys who's sort of thinking in 4D. But yeah, I really, really, really love East Bay Ray's guitar playing. Yeah. It's this crazy. Like at some point I thought I'm going to learn some Dave Kennedy songs because I'm learning to play guitar and that should be easy. Incorrect. Yeah. Those are not in any way easy songs. I think there's 20 something chords in Holiday in Cambodia. It is absolutely bananas. <laughs> so, so you're painting. You do a lot of fine art painting now and you're playing with just about everybody in the world and you're traveling a lot. You're doing meds. Seems like you're in a good place. Yeah. It kind of feels, kind of feels pretty good. Um, I'm home for the summer, which is nice. Isn't that glorious? Yeah. Shushu and Thor and Friends start touring again in the fall, but I'm going to work on all these records for Joyful Noise over the summer, play on a few other people's records. Yeah. yeah. How, many, how many dogs do you have now? Four and eight cats. Eight it's cats. Good. Yeah, it's a good scene here. They all yeah. come and go as they please through a pet door. So, yeah. You know, when you're hanging out here, sometimes you may only see three or four cats at a time, but there are eight that live here. Yeah. You know, um, that's a video, and I don't know who made it. It might have been Texas Public Television, but I'm not sure. That was sort of the introduction to Ocean of Despair and all that for me. And there was a woman who was your ex in that video. Oh, yeah, Marianne. That was the relationship that you had to sort of bail out of to join the Swans and, and get better? Yeah. Um, it was in the middle of Swans, mm -hmm. uh, Swans raging uh, um, comeback that just, me, and, me and Marianne broke up. But she still lives just down the street. She's a nurse. She helps, she helps at-risk people get medications to, to end needles and things to try to not get hiv yeah um yeah yeah she yeah. works she works a lot with junkies and um people who lead who have risky lifestyles i was super inspired by the kindness you guys showed each other in that video <laughs> yeah yeah I, uh i guess at that point we were just friends i think we had yeah you'd already... broken up in that video but you yeah. guys were still kind to each other, which I just I found that hugely inspiring because yeah. so many people project all of their own failings on their ex, you know. Oh man, yeah. I'm I'm friends with almost all of my exes and there a lot of them are just the greatest people ever. A lot of them are still major inspirations and heroes to me. Yeah. I think that's a, a testament to to like your willingness to to admit fault yeah yeah and and also take responsibility for the person that you were and the person who you are now and who you're becoming yeah that's good stuff I mean I like to wind these interviews up I have a series of eight questions that I ask every guest um, all right and uh um they're not quick questions uh well sometimes they are depends on just how solid people are in their answers. Um, it's based loosely on the Bernard Pivo 10 questions that they end uh, inside the actor studio with. But um, because everybody knows those questions, I felt like I had to come up with questions on my own so I didn't get preconceived answers. But um, if you're ready for that, we can jump in. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. What is your fondest memory of a meal that you've ever had? Hmm. You know, uh, it's funny. Everybody says they love food. I, I, 
I have a kind of um, I I don't I I I I do like to eat like anybody else, but um, I started eating sort of like a hunter gatherer, like just sort of slowly throughout the day, and I've been doing that for decades now. Mm-hmm. So I rarely have like big fantastic meals anymore. Although sometimes on tour you sort of have to. Yeah. Because there's like this time that you have to eat and you 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 only have a little bit of time. But I'm like I really celebrate breakfast. I've gotten to where I eat more in the morning and less and less throughout the day. Yeah. So probably probably um probably breakfast every day. Is is? Do you hear that barking? That's Chance I, the dog. I heard Chance muttering before Chance barked. I heard this kind of whoa, 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 yeah. which is often the alpha dog. Like, are you going to make me get involved in this? <laughs> yeah. He's waiting. He's waiting to see if he's needed. Am I needed? Right. He's back up because Francie's out there working the front yard. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I I probably I I. Um, I guess I don't have a good answer, but I... There's no right I, or wrong answer. Every, a lot of every, times... Every me, day I celebrate breakfast with... Yeah. Um, what do you usually have? Just un, usually oatmeal with like... I, I've, because I've quit dairy recently, usually mm-hmm. with like soy milk and nuts and blueberries and things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm also like a worshiper of coffee. I've been drinking coffee since... My first construction job when I was like fifteen, and um, I need to send you a can of this espresso that the local coffee roaster is making for the podcast. Yeah, it's good Hell stuff. Yeah, yeah, I'll get one of those in the mail to you. Cool. Or I'll just bring it. I'm coming to Austin in a couple of weeks, so Great. actually a week. I'll be there on the tenth. So uh, yeah, less less than two weeks. Great. Okay. Uh, the next question is changed because the first time the, when I first started asking this question, I would ask people, what is the most frightened you've ever been? And for men, that answer fell within a certain number of categories um, that were all fairly acceptable to discuss on a podcast. But the first or no, the second or third time I asked a woman guest that question, she gave me a look that made me really second guess the question as far as what's appropriate for a woman who who's experienced life in, in America in the 21st century, like to ask her that question was potentially going to bring out some trauma. So I offer you also, like, if you don't want to answer the question, what's the most frightened you've ever been? Um, what is the time you've been, you've been braver than you ever thought you could be? Going insane when I was 27, that was the most frightened I've ever been. As, as my mind began to, truly disintegrate and i and i felt like whatever i thought of as myself was dissolving um that was terrifying and and i didn't i thought this is a kind of trouble i'm in a kind of trouble that i've never even imagined and i had pain and horror in in places in my mind that I didn't even know existed. I mean, it's true that there's a lot of places in our minds that we don't know about or have access to. Well, at that time, a lot of, a lot of those places, I had access to them and they were just horror. It it was, it was, it was absolutely terrifying. I didn't think I would make it back from, from that my first nervous breakdown i want to bring that term back nervous breakdown it's a term from the early 20th century right and i and i think it really fit it was more fitting to what i went through when i um had had my first really crushing depressive episode the term nervous breakdown fits so I I have it, that brings up several questions for me all at once. Um, but first of all, 
Do, do you watch horror movies? Do you ever watch horror movies? Yeah, I, I like horror movies. I don't watch that many movies at all these days, uh-huh. but I but I, I love horror movies. I, I Because I already have anxiety, I'm just like, no, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't yeah. want to go there. Because uh, that for me, the worst part about uh, having anxiety attacks and this sort of like uh, – I don't think them as nervous breakdowns for me, but more of just like um, being on lockdown, being unable to move forward because yeah. of um, and what compounds it is. I have it hasn't happened in a long time, but it's this huge racing, smoking, heaving anxiety, um, coupled with shame for not being normal. Yeah, and I just yeah. get locked into place, always, and it's not a good spot. Always the shame for not being normal do you feel like that moment with the snake was a turning point or was it just another day of horror in it east wasn't texas? It, it was just another day of horror in east texas i I felt there was there was because i felt more i felt like i was the same thing as the snake with its guts the dead snake right was more like what i was than my niece, a, a live, beautiful, beautiful baby, full of potential, I, I, and yeah, I would yeah. hold, I would hold her in one arm, and she's felt like a total alien to me. But then laying there next to a dead snake, I felt like, aha, I felt like, yeah, I felt like here's my peer, is, yeah, here, here's my peer, a dead right. snake in the right. road. Right. Well, I feel like we're maybe we're equals now. How did you claw your way out of that? Did it just gradually dissipate over time? Yeah, it took a long time and meds and yeah. a lot of books about different people's accounts of depression. And I did have to stop like looking into my mind to see if I was still insane. Like I I, I had to stop the 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 sort of self-monitoring that I started doing um, in, in, uh, I guess the first part of 92, as I felt myself going insane, I would, yeah. I would do all of this introspective checking on my, to see how my brain worked. Well, I really had to stop doing that. Yeah. Because it's the opposite of acceptance, right? Yeah. Yeah. To constantly be like, is it better yet? Is it better yet? Is it better yet? It's just going to create its own little pool of anxiety. Yeah, I had made this horrible feedback loop where Mm -hmm. my illness and how much it was or wasn't better was making me more ill. Yeah. What is the thing that you've lost in your life that you regret losing the most? Hmm. Wow, I I losing people to death is I know inevitable. Um but it's still in some ways to me regrettable my phone rang the other day my mom's been dead for two years and I thought maybe it's mom so there aren't there aren't things that I care about having lost but but um Losing people is still really hard for me to accept. Yeah. I think that's maybe true of just about everybody. You know, you can still hear your lost loved ones' voices and imagine the way they said your name. And those days are just, they're just gone. Yeah, it's really hard for me. I still pull my phone out. To call my grandmother sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, I remember 
before I lost my my mom. Yeah, longing to to be able to talk to my grandmother. Yeah, she was really wise. My grandma was about the same age as your mom, a little yeah. bit, a little bit older. But I was just near there. I was just you know, Pinky Doodle Poodle played some shows in North Carolina, really close to the little town that I'm from, and the houses have a look, and they have yeah. these silver fuel oil tanks that they used to use to heat. Oh yeah. Those little houses and they have this look and, and there's the special oak tree that's got this enormous leaf and these acorns the size of your thumb. And just like seeing all those things and the sun went down and I heard the night insects that I used to hear because my grandparents didn't have air, air conditioning the first few years of my life. And yeah, I would, I would lie in that house and hear the sort of sounded like the forest was breathing with the cicadas. And I just, man. I get really nostalgic for that time in my life because my grandparents were the rock, you know. Whereas yeah, mine of- too. Yeah. I it was funny at the end of this last shoe shoe tour, we drove through the town of Wichita Falls, Texas, and I drove by my grandma's house, which was just a magical place to me when I was a little kid. It's a farmhouse on the edge of town. It's the first place I ever saw snow. I think. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was just a, a an amazing place that still holds all this memory in my subconscious. Yeah, it was neat to see that place again. Yeah, I, I'm I'm still trying to sort of come to grips with being close to my hometown without feeling a tremendous sadness. It's yeah. hard for me. I haven't really ever let go of my grandparents. So, tell yeah. me about a time you've received an act of kindness from a stranger. Um, boy, so much kindness. Um, once I was, uh, I was on my way to, this was, uh, this was back in 92. I was not well yet but i was kind of clawing my way back from my first ever nervous breakdown and and i was i had set this deadline if i'm not better in six weeks i'm gonna kill myself and so i was on my way either to my to my shrink's office or i was gonna kill myself and i was riding a bike and it was real hot and i stopped and again laid down on the hot um, concrete on a bridge um, in Austin and this kid shows up I'm just laying there on the on the on this bridge and this kid shows up and just starts talking to me about having moved back to Austin from Houston he's just talking and it was just so uh I don't know, something about that kid talking to me just pulled me out of my own murderous thoughts. And um, just sort of inspired me to ride my bike to my shrink's office and tell him I wasn't doing so well. And instead of riding and jumping off of this really high bridge... um, so I don't, you know, I don't even know if that kid. He certainly didn't know that that I was there, like contemplating ending it all. But um, I was sure glad he showed up and just started, just started rambling to me. It's interesting to me that you you chose the term murderous thoughts instead of suicidal thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Once well, my friend. We were talking about suicide and its pros and cons, and sh- and she said, "Well, it is murder." And I thought, "Wow, yeah, it kind of is, isn't it? It's like ending a life that you really didn't have any choice in starting." Right. Well, f- for me, this like there's sort of several 
different kinds of suicidal ideation. And for me, it was always such a high level of self-loathing that I was like, I'm not going to kill myself. I'm going to fucking murder this asshole that is me. Yeah. Because I'm yeah. fucking sick of his shit. And um, so I, I've never really thought of it in terms of murder, though. I've just thought – I just – like the, the level of, of disregard for my own self was so high that it – did. Did you ever have it? Did you ever have it where it, it where it felt like a mercy killing, like it was so painful to continue in this life that that you were freeing yourself from its entrapments? I think maybe. So you know, a couple of episodes ago, I had a guy on named Boo Ray, and he was detoxing from opiates in a, in a state-run facility and they start you off to get you through the shake so you don't rattle yourself to death they they just heavily dose you with barbiturates to get you through the opiate withdrawal and then the taper from opiates to no drugs at all is 48 hours which is really brutal um and he hit this point of just like despair to the point that he fashioned a noose out of his hospital gown and and hanged himself on the doorknob, and as he was sort of tying this thing up, because you know he was a former, he grew up working cattle in, in eastern and western North Carolina, and so he knew all the knots. So he's very carefully tying this slip knot, thinking, well, I guess this just didn't work out, and and I never got to that point of resignation where it was like a mercy killing. I was so frustrated and angry at the person that that kept doing all this damage in other people's lives mm, yeah. that I felt like it was more like taking down a rabid dog, you know? Um, wow. Yeah. And, and yeah. So the fight never really went out of me to the point that I thought this is the point where I just pull the plug. So that I can stop suffering more like I need to stop causing suffering in other people was my sort of particular brand of self-loathing. Yeah. That's harsh. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's inspired a lot of, uh, a lot of very, uh, enthusiastic punk drumming though. <laughs> yeah. It's like when people say, man, you really hit those drums hard. I'm like, yeah, I have a, a deep well of anger to drop from. <laughs> That's what I'm yeah. talking about. Just yeah. Hey, what, what's your favorite place to gig? Uh, I don't know. I I um, I I love touring Europe. Um, Shushu, we just did five and a half weeks over there. Thorn Friends did two weeks. I I. I like playing in America too, of course, but um, I don't know. It feels like Europe Europeans love music so much. Um, I li- I like touring over there a lot. That's, that's been a recurring theme uh, in these questions. A lot of people who have played Europe are like, "There's just a whole different approach to like bands playing in Europe," and there's a level of of um, just enthusiasm about there's an American band here. I want to see this band and it sort of transcends consumer culture. Like, yeah, you, you don't just get people who are treating your music like a lifestyle accessory. It's not just 20 somethings who are into hip new bands. It's like when, when the Lolos, when I was playing with Parker, uh, our mutual friend, uh, Parker, who's now lives in Portland, I was at a band with him called the Lolos, and we played in this town in southern Spain called Benissa, and the whole city came out. Like, yeah, that you know, that happens in Europe. Like everyone, yeah. every age comes to your show. It's just. Is there a specific city in Europe, or just just being there? Just being there, the whole. I I love playing in Ireland. I love those people. Dublin's a great city, but yeah, I, I really like all of europe i love berlin um berlin seems really cool i've not been there yeah it's it's really great i've spent a bunch of time there swans made half of one of our records there and i've made 
records there with this new band that I'm in called No Place Trio. Mm-hmm. Um, with two guys that live in Berlin. Oh, I remember seeing that you were going out on tour with them like a year and a half ago or something. Yeah. Yeah. I was really stoked for you. That sounded like something I would love to do. It was fun. It was, com- yeah, it was instrumental improv every single night. Terrifying. That sounds like, yeah, terrifying is exactly the word I was about to say. <laughs> Performing without a net for sure. Yeah. So, with that in mind, uh, income and visa considerations aside, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would you live? Um, I think before I die, I'd like to live in the mountains somewhere. Um, although I think, even though they're under threat right now, I think the European socialist democracies are probably the best places to live in the world. So I would love to live. I don't know. Maybe in the in the Pyrenees, in the mountains in Europe, or somewhere in the Alps. I was going to say Swiss Alps. Sounds like it's right in the in the pocket of what you're describing. Yeah. The. Uh, Do you yeah, speak the, any other languages? Not really. I learned to say thank you in a lot of languages, but so many people in Europe speak at least some English. Yeah, because Americans have always traveled so much. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm still I still feel like America is home. So I think the reality of it is that Peg and I once once she, if if she ever stops practicing acupuncture in Austin, or if she ever stops working at that clinic we might move to the pacific northwest just to just to be where there's too much rain and not enough sunlight because i've lived my entire life in a place where there's too much sunlight and not quite enough rain i've lived in in texas um just you know right on the well central texas is right on the border where texas starts to become a desert yeah so I'd like to live in a place that looks and feels very different from this. A little greener. Yeah. Georgia's nice. You got a good spot. Yeah, man. I'm here in the in back in the trees. It's nice. Yeah. yeah. So do you have a, a an ideal or perfect musical instrument? And if you do, do you own it? Yeah, I own a lot of them. For me, that changes over time. But... Right now, my 4.3 octave marimba is my favorite musical instrument. But it does, Mm -hmm. you know, like I said, it changes over time. I I grew up being a drum set player mostly. Yeah. But but I got cast in the role of mallet player, uh, I guess in swans mostly. And so I've gotten pretty okay at that. And, um, and I build a lot of weird instruments too. I just built this electric tongue drum. It's like a it's like a one of those wooden box tongue drums, but it has two transducer pickups built in. Mm-hmm. And um and you can run it through effects and through a giant bass amp. That's really a, a blast to play. But yeah, it's 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 always changing. And the more the more instruments like I'm learning trumpet right now, the more instruments that I that I pick up and learn and I don't get really good at them. I'm a good drummer, but I'm just an adequate clarinet player, viola player. It's just kind of always changing and I really, you know, it's pretty easy to fall in love with an instrument. Where was that marimba made? This one was made in England. This favorite one of mine. I have four, um, but yeah. this but this one is from England. Um, marimba is yeah. primarily though an African instrument, right? Uh, I guess so. I I think it might be one of those instruments that was, you know, like hammer dulcimer that was kind of simultaneously invented by every culture in the world, just because it's an obvious thing to do, like cut bars of wood to a certain length and beat on them you know it's 
it's um but but yeah i i i think it was probably first invented in africa yeah when do you practice if you're like learning all these new instruments i mean practicing trumpet trying to get good at trumpet it's not something you can do without everyone knowing that you're trying to get good at trumpet you know when when i i have done a lot of it while i'm on tour i would i'll just sit out you know by the dumpster or whatever and and bring an electronic tuner with me and just blow uh notes and and um work on basic skills because there's so much downtime during tours yeah that's 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 when i've learned new instruments mostly a little bit at home you know just hanging around at home between you know between working construction and sleeping i'll i'll put in a little bit of time on some instrument that i'm not that good at that i feel like right I'd like to be better at. Okay, last question. Um, I want you to imagine a taxi that's not really constrained by sort of um, uh, time and space as we know them and can go anywhere um, into the past or into the future, anywhere on the planet. You you get into this taxi and you say to the driver, okay, man, uh, take me home. Where, Where are you going? Wow. That's a good one. Um, I sort of feel like like I want to go somewhere somewhere like Norway or Scotland, which is where my ancestors are from, and sometime around about a thousand years ago. I, I feel like I don't know. I can't say that it was a mistake for my people to have come here and committed the atrocities that we've committed in America. But when I go back to Scotland, I, I feel I feel more home. I feel Scotland and northern northwestern Europe, Scandinavia. Yeah. I feel more more like why did my people ever leave here? And I know that. Those places have had some hard times, especially in the 20th century. Um, so it was probably better for my ancestors to have gotten out of there. But yeah, some, sometimes that feels more like home than 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 uh, America does in a in a way. Yeah. Now, now those places are these like super peaceful, stable socialist democracies too. So it's pretty easy for me to idealize those places now. Go there, and people look like me, and um, and it and it feels like wow, I'm probably related to many of you people. But um, that's funny. I felt that way in North Carolina last week. <laughs> I kept yeah. asking people, where are you from? And I kept getting people who were from Eden. And I I, I, I didn't grow up there. I spent my summers there with my grandparents. We had moved away pretty early and I would I would ask people their last names and I think, oh man, I think my grandparents might have gone to church with your grandparents and that kind of thing. But yeah. yeah. Um my you know North Carolina is so amazingly beautiful. One year, me and Bill Callahan did a tour. It was just the two of us. We played as a two-piece. Um, and and we drove somehow. That It was the first time ever. And the tour routing was such that we drove from the coast in North Carolina to Asheville, the mountains. That's a really long drive. Man, it was so beautiful. Just every yeah. kind of beautiful scenery you can imagine. I well, think you go through like three FDA zones. You know, the like, uh, this plan is Harney and Zone 7. I think that there's a coastal yeah. Piedmont and mountain zones all in North Carolina. It's it's a hugely diverse state. Yeah. But the Piedmont, north central North Carolina where I'm from, is people are just sweet in a way It's that – you don't see in other parts. It, it, so, so Southerners have a reputation as being genial, friendly people, but even amongst other Southerners, people in Winston-Salem, Kernersville, Greensboro, Eden, Reedsville, 
Danville, Virginia, where I'm from, have a special special thing. It's hard to describe. Yeah, I mean, and all cultural things put aside, if I was to pick a geo, geo, geological or is it geographical? If I was to pick like the the really sweet spot of America, it would be somewhere around there. Like, I think a lot of people are figuring that out, which is sort of harder on people who've lived there their whole lives, though. Like, there's a phenomenon they refer to as halfway homers, which are people who, like, got to the point where they could they had a pension and a retirement plan in in the industrial Northeast or the industrial Midwest, and they moved to Florida, thinking this is going to be great. And then Florida is just like living in a, it's just like it's, it's over 90 degrees more often than it's not. And it's incredibly humid. It's just like living inside someone's mouth. And so eventually people are like, no, this isn't cutting it. So they move halfway home to Western North Carolina. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, it's funny, man, that like the very nature of capitalism is that if something gets popular, then it gets too expensive. You're experiencing that in Austin, you know, it's sort yeah. of frustrating. I, I really love Western North Carolina and would love to live there. Um, but man, you know, it's not a lot of jobs because it's mostly retired people and young people who don't have like big professional aspirations. That's why they disconnect from society and move to Western North Carolina. But like, how, how do you, how do you pay for things? You know, it's tough. Yeah. But boy, is it pretty. So pretty. If you like fishing or being on trails or being in the woods, it's pretty remarkable. Yeah. Man, I can't wait to see you next week. This yeah, has been I can't great. wait to see you, Patrick. I um, I've been looking Thanks. forward to this interview for a long time, and, I'm, and it, it lived up to every one of my expectations. Great. Thanks for having me on the show. No, thank you. All right. See you all soon. All right. All right. Bye bye. That was that was everything I hoped it would be. I really love Thor so much, and I can't wait to see him in, a, in like a week when I'm in Austin. Um, we're gonna hang out and drink coffee and and um, and, and pet dogs and, and just do drummer stuff. Um, so thanks for listening. I'm so glad that I was uh, able to share that with you because I feel like it was maybe maybe the the interview I've been uh, that this whole thing was kind of founded on this idea that you could be a working musician. And, and and work through the stuff that, that makes us sad and angry and, and anxious and, and and still work, you know. Um, so thanks, Thor. Um, I want to remind everybody that if you're uh, having a tough time and you're having dark days and you're contemplating self-harm, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is toll-free. It's confidential. Um, it's 24-7. It's staffed by trained volunteers, one 800 273 Eight two five five, and if you're a trans person who needs support, there's the Trans Lifelines Peer Support Line that I just found out about this week. One eight seven seven five six five eight eight six zero. Thanks for your continued support. It, I just this is I feel like the luckiest guy in the world right now, um, and I really appreciate everything that everybody's done for the podcast. And and man, keep keep coming back and listening and, and keep sending me feedback, both, um, you know, suggestions for how I could be better and, and, um, and, and let me know if it's helped you at all. Cause it, it means the world to me when someone says, man, your podcast has made a difference in my life. In the meantime, be kind to yourself, take care of yourself, ask for help. If you need it, go see live music, support your favorite band. And remember that loud guitars save lives. <laughs>